Faith Works Live. It's our joy to be with you, where we talk about what it looks like to live out our faith uh, when, here and now, in this crazy old, chaotic, mixed up Romans 1 world. That's where we are, smack dab in the middle of it, and God doesn't get the address wrong. You are here for such a time as this. I'm glad to be with you, man. This is going to be so much fun. We're talking about, oh, all the controversy today. We're talking about whether or not Jesus Christ really is the the way, the truth, and the life, because um, that's what he says. Uh, but there's some pretty prominent leaders that would claim the name of Christ, and in particular, one very prominent leader that all the world looks to that said something a little strange, something uh, kind of uh, like opposed to exactly what I thought Christianity was all about. So before we go off, you know, we want to get our facts straight. We want to think well about this. Um, I have to to talk to one of my favorite thinkers on pretty much all subjects, um, Dr. Ever, at least all the ones he writes about. Uh, <laughs> he gets to be the expert in all the things he writes about. And he is a writer. He's an author. He's a columnist and commentator. Um, and one of my favorite Christian intellectuals, Dr. Everett Piper, joined our airwaves yet again. Dr. Piper, always a joy to have you with us. Thanks for uh, being on the show. No, no problem. Honored to be on your show, Rebecca. All right. So you tackled this topic, and I think a lot of people may have heard bits and pieces of what happened. Uh, but the Pope was asked a question about, uh, and he was he had a prepared statement. So he was delivering remarks. I guess that's a little bit more accurate. And he deviated from those remarks to say something that was pretty troubling for a lot of people. Uh, he said, quote, every religion is a way to arrive at God. He said sort of a comparison would be like they're all different languages to arrive at God, but God is God for all. So we are all sons and daughters of God. There is only one God, and each of us has a language to arrive at him. Sikh, Muslim, Hindu, Christians, they are all just different paths. And I would say, say what? Say what now? Um, that seems like antithetical yeah. to Jesus' statements in John 14 that I am the way, he said. I am the way, <laughs> definite article, the way. And so when you, and you were asked a question about this and you wrote a column about this, responding to this as well, is this is troubling. This is very strange and it seems to be very, again, just flat out opposed to what Christ himself proclaimed, wouldn't it be? Well, yes. In fact, um, the context for why you're asking me this, just so your listeners know, um, I write a couple weekly columns for the Washington Times. One of them is an opinion piece that comes out on the weekends, but the second column I write for the Washington Times is one that we want that uh, they ask me to write and craft around a Dear Abby or you know a Q and A type column. Um, Dear Abby, I'm dating myself here, I guess, but <laughs> a Q and A type column. Dear Everett. So, it's called Dear Dr. E. Perfect. And um, here's the question. So we'll we'll discuss it right now in the context of this Q&A. So my questioner says this, I'm curious about your take on Pope Francis's statement this week that various religions are like different languages, which all lead to the same God. Do you think what the Pope said is consistent with Orthodox biblical Christianity, or is he mistaken, sincerely seeking God from South Carolina? And you know, Rebecca, that my answer was, no, this is not, well, yes, he's mistaken, and no, his answer is not consistent with historical, biblical, orthodox Christianity, which is rather ironic. Um, it, Catholics would consider the Pope to be the vicar of Christ, the representative of Christ for the church. And Catholics have been making this claim for nearly 2,000 years. I was on a radio station this morning out of Cleveland, Ohio, where the host is a conservative, faithful Catholic. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to be gracious to him before the show. I didn't want to spring this one on him for obvious reasons. So I sure. asked him off air, you okay if we talk about this? He said, absolutely. He said, I've got a lot of things I want to talk to the Pope about, and this is one of them. So this just isn't a conservative, fundamentalist, evangelical, Protestant overreaction to the Pope. Mm -hmm. This is a reaction that many, and I would argue millions, of faithful Catholics are having the same concern with the Pope right. jumping ship, uh, so to speak, 
and becoming syncretistic and um, universalistic in some of his statements. This doesn't sound biblical. So, yeah, there's a problem here. And what Pope Francis is saying is something that the church, his church, the Catholic Church Universal, has spoken out against for 2,000 years at its ecumenical councils. Uh, th these types of views that the Pope is expressing right now have been declared anathema. And that's a word that the Catholic Church uses with great heavy weight and force, anathema. So the Pope is saying things that sure sound like statements that have been said some 1,500 years ago and more mm -hmm. as being anathema to the very gospel of Jesus Christ as defined by the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So whether you're Protestant, whether you're Catholic, whether you're Anabaptist, whether you're Anglican, whether you're uh, Assembly of God, whether you're ecumenical, or, uh, ecumenical whether you're um, uh, Episcopal, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter for the sake of this conversation. All of us within that those categories should agree to what I'm going to say right now. Jesus is the Son of God. He's the second person of the triune God. Salvation comes through Christ alone. We believe the Bible, and we believe the Bible is God's revelation to man, and that it's a true reflection of what God wants us to think about him and what he wants us to know about our relationship with him. I don't think anything I just said in those previous couple sentences should be controversial to any confessing Christian, whether they be right. Catholic, Protestant, whether they be Baptist, or whether they be somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. So what I think we need to do, Rebecca, is hold ourselves to the ultimate measuring rod outside of things being measured, and that's the word of God. And the Pope, I I would like to believe, would agree with that, that he, he should be held to the ultimate measuring rod outside of things being measured, and that's the Bible. You can do no measuring without a measuring rod outside of those things being measured, C.S. Lewis, and what for the Christian is that measuring rod. It's the, the Bible. Yep. Yes, it's, it's the Bible. It's God's revelation. Now we could get into a debate, where does tradition, church tradition, whatnot fall in there? But I would think even your Catholic and Orthodox listeners would agree that if tradition and the Bible come into conflict, that the Bible has to be the trump card. Right. I would hope that they would agree with that. So let's just, for the sake of argument, Assume that the Bible is our trump card in terms of defining the Christian faith. Okay. And defining God and our relationship with God. Well, what does the Bible say? Well, you quoted one verse. Well, let's go and look at some others. Okay. Let's look at some other verses. Um, and these are just a handful. Uh, Matthew makes it clear. Okay. In the Gospel of Matthew, it's made very clear where Jesus not, will not only acknowledge, excuse me, Jesus makes it clear that at the end of days, only those who acknowledge him will he acknowledge. And what's the verse? Everyone who confesses me before men, he will I confess before my father. But whoever denies me before men, him will I deny before my father, which is in heaven. Mm -hmm. So it seems that Matthew, in his recording of what Jesus preached, is being very clear if you acknowledge Jesus, he'll acknowledge you. If you believe in Jesus, that is the prerequisite, the bottom line assumption on how to gain access to the Heavenly Father is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And those who deny Jesus are not going to have access to the Father. That's the Piper paraphrase of what I just read, but I think I'm pretty close, aren't I? I like okay. it. Yes. Yeah. And I think you're spot on. There's also a clearly where Jesus makes it clear in Matthew 7 that not all who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my father. Um, so there are there's plenty of he he makes himself a dividing line. And I think that's that can only be possible because he is, in fact, what he claimed to be. He is the son of God. He is the way and the truth and the life. So it is it's the ultimate 
ultimate in loving compassion for him to come and provide that way for us. But it's also just true for him to say, if you're outside of that, uh, I'm warning you, please, please come to me, come to the, come, come in, come, I am the door, I am the shepherd. And anyone outside of that, which is going back to the Pope's statement, he's essentially saying he, he labels several different world religions and, and several of them would not claim anything particularly special about Jesus. They may revere him as a special teacher or, or a special holy, even a prophet of some sort, um, but they would not say that he is the son of God. Uh, and so to, to then say, well, that's okay. They can believe whatever they want. And we're all just going to get to God in our own language, in our own time, in our own path. These are things I've heard before, but but it is not Christian and it's not what Christ said. And it's also not compassionate or loving to say those things mm -hmm. because it is guaranteeing them that they're not on the narrow path of Christ, the only one that actually leads to God. And, and don't you have to ask yourself, what's the point of the church? What's the point of Christianity if you're going to stand before uh, a crowd as the Pope was? And this was a conference that had multiple religious leaders on stage. I went and watched the video. I don't know if you did or not. I watched the video because I wanted to I wanted to figure out, was he taken out of context? Because often you hear that about the Pope. Well, right. that's out of context. Well, no, this isn't out of context. He's on the stage with multiple world leaders, Sikhs, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, and, and here you've got the Pope. They're mm -hmm. all up in the religious garb, the regalia. And the Pope says, well, why should we fight about which religion is better? That's another part of his quote. You say your religion is better than mine. Well, where does that get us? That's part mm -hmm. of his quote. So he's saying that one religion is no better than the other, that there are multiple paths that lead to God, that the various different religious, religious descriptions of God are nothing more than a different language, Spanish, French, English, on communicating who God is. These are very disturbing things. And you have to ask yourself the question, well, Pope Francis, what's the point? What's the point of the Christian church if it's no different than, than a Baha'i temple? Right. Why, why are you doing what you do? Why, why are you telling us to pray to Jesus Christ? Why are you telling us that Mass is important? Why are you telling us that the Eucharist is critical to a relationship with Jesus, Catholic tradition here and teaching? It, 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 if, if you don't have to do any of that, if being, um, if being a syncretist that, that buys into the Baha'i faith, for example, which is essential syncretism, that all religious leaders are the same, we just need to pick and choose out of various different religious statements, the ones that we like, and we have a big group hug, great, a big kumbaya moment, and we're all going to march up to the top of the summit together and all mm -hmm. sing kumbaya and hug each other because we're all marching toward God. Hmm. nonsense you know here's another way to look at it there's um there was an apologist uh, a well-known apologist a few years ago he was making a presentation at harvard i think it was an ivy league institution and after he got done making a presentation defending the christian the biblical world view there was a q a and there was a bright young student a harvard student who raised his hand and said Dr. Smith, I, I understand everything you just said in defending the Christian faith, but you seem to be implying the exclusivity of Christianity, that it's the only viable option. I disagree with you. I think there are multiple paths up the mountain to the same God, and we're all going to get there via our own chosen paths. Christianity is just one of those. And this apologist responded and said, okay, Again, this is my paraphrase. You're telling me that all religions are the same. Well, I, I, I guess they are the same, um, except for the definition of God, the definition of man, the definition of the woman, the definition of good and evil, right and wrong, ontology, epistemology, theology, the definition of heaven and hell and eternity. I guess if you set these minor issues aside, all religions are the same. Except for that. And I think it's a perfect response. And you, you, somebody ought to sit down with Pope Francis and say the same thing. Don't you, as a Christian, Francis, believe that the definition of God, i.e. the triune God, with Jesus, Jesus being the second person of the triune God, is different than the Muslim, 
definition, mm-hmm. which denies the deity of Jesus Christ, denies the virgin birth, denies the resurrection of Christ. So how can you say that we're all on the same journey, just different paths to the same definition of God? Yeah. Well, and the only way that you can do that is by denying that there is such a thing as objective truth, by denying what the entire, essentially here in Western civilization, which the Roman Catholic Church has a a huge stake in it, and it was foundational in our formation as a Western civilization as well. Uh, Their interpretation specifically of Christianity and their infrastructure has created in large part much of European uh, Western civilization as we know it today. So it's so strange that then he would basically contradict one of their those foundational principles and say, well, everyone's just basically the same, that all these religions are basically just passed to the same God, because it it undermines one of the core pillars of not just Christianity, but also Western logic and understanding, which is that two opposing things can't both be true at the same time. Here, Jesus claims specifically to be God. He says he is the son of God, and he says he is the way to God. And all the original apostles preached exactly the same thing. The original Christians preached and and proclaimed and died martyrs' deaths for exactly that same thing. They didn't decide to just kind of go along with their uh, polytheistic culture and say, okay, you know, the Greeks and the Romans and the barbarians and everybody, they've all got their own paths to God. And we should all just kind of, I, I like Jesus, but that works for me and you do you. And so we can all just get along and we can maybe build some sort of interfaith coalition with uh, the Hellenites and the, you know, the Jew, the, the Zeus worshipers and the, the Dionysians over here. None of them said that. They stood up and they said, there is one king and his name is Jesus Christ. There is one Lord and we need to repent and we need to believe that he was crucified for our sins and that he rose again and that he will come again in judgment, that we are guilty of, of the, the sin that he died for and that we can have life eternal through faith in Jesus Christ. Christ, that we need to follow him and him alone and reject any other pretenders that there is no other God before him. Um, and, and they were willing to go to their, in many cases, grisly, horrible deaths to defend yep. that statement. They refused to recant by saying Jesus is Lord. It is by definition exclusive because you're saying nobody else can compare. Nobody else can compete. Nobody else can sit on the throne except for Jesus Christ, who is alone worthy. And by refusing to back off of that statement, many of them lost their lives, but they you know, they turn the world upside down, scripture says. And that's the type of faith that I thought we were called to have. Like That's the yeah. team well, I thought we were yeah. on. And what you're saying right now is so important for everybody to understand. And remember, this isn't new. What you just said is not new. We all know that the church has been built on the blood of its martyrs. Okay, the seed of the church is the blood of the martyrs. So the church was planted through the sacrificial deaths of those who refused to do exactly what Francis apparently is calling on people to do. Because we know, history tells us that many of the early Christians, all they needed to do is say, well, I worship that God too. Yeah. They, they, if they would have just said, Caesar is God, then they still would have been permitted to, oh, well, you can have your other God. You can have that Jesus God too, but you need to declare Caesar is God. So all they needed to do is buy into this syncretism that all religions are in sync and that we can have various different gods all leading to the same place. Caesar's God, and if you want Jesus to be God, fine. And if you want that Yahweh character that the Jews believe in, well, you can have him too. It's mm-hmm. essentially what they're being asked to do. And what did what does history tell us? The church history tells us they refused. They refused to say Caesar is God. And therefore, like you said, very gruesome and uh, terrible deaths. They were impaled on pikes. They were eaten by animals. They knew this was going to happen to them and their children, and they still did it anyway because they recognized, no, there's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. You know, Paul tells us there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. John tells us, uh, after where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life, no one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus then says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but mm-hmm. the wrath of God remains on him. 
You know, Paul says to the church of Rome when he writes his epistle to Rome, he says, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. So that confession is important. That belief in the death resurrection of Christ is the prerequisite. It's mandatory. It's necessary for mm -hmm. salvation. You can't Throw that out the window and claim that you're a Sikh or a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Muslim and say, well, I'm in good stead. Right. Uh, there, there's just so much in the Bible that says this Christian faith is exclusive. Yeah. There is, it is not just one of many. It's not a smorgasbord. It's not a pick and choose faith. And, and here's another thing, another angle for us to talk about. Um, I don't know if you've ever had Abdu Murray on your show or not. Ab I yeah, I'm not on this show, but on other shows where I've worked with him, I've gotten the chance to connect with him. And he's he's very smart. He's okay. crazy smart. He's crazy smart. And Abdu, uh, for those that don't know, Abdu grew up as a Muslim uh, in Dearborn, Michigan. I became friends with Abdu through Josh McDowell a few years ago. And Abdu, being a very bright young man and very committed Muslim, uh, was studying law at the University of Michigan. And one of his hobbies was debating Christians because he found that Christians didn't know their Bible at all. So it was mm. fun to humiliate them and embarrass them by asking them questions. As a faithful Muslim, he would debate Christians for fun. And he found that nobody knew how to defend their faith. They didn't know the Bible as well as he did. Mm. Well, long story short, through God's grace, Abdu comes to Christ. The more he read the Bible, the more he recognized that it was true. And Abdu will tell you, that if you walk up to somebody like he was, somebody that's a faithful, obedient Muslim that knows his Quran and knows his Bible, that if you tell him that Islam and Christianity are the same and that they're both paths to the same God, that he, as a Muslim, would be incredibly offended. And he mm -hmm. would think you're really stupid. First of all, you're offending me by suggesting that Islam is the same as Christianity. And he would look you in the eye and say, no, it's not. We deny Christ. Yep. The, 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 the surah that is printed around the outside of the Dome of the Rock, right below the Blue Dome, there, there are Arabic letters in white below the Blue Dome. Those letters are what? They're the surah that deny the Trinity and deny the virgin birth yep. of Jesus Christ. There is one God, Allah, and Allah has no son. There you go. Yep. There you go. So don't, I mean, Abdu would say, don't insult a Muslim by suggesting that Christianity is the same, because you're going to get nowhere in terms of evangelism if you suggest that. Yeah, and it's it's contradictory. It's not true. Uh, and it's bothersome that I, I think the only excuse for it, really, for somebody that claims to not only to know Christ, but to represent him on the world stage at such a a high level it's it's the pinnacle really what people think of in terms of earthly like christian leadership or office is the pope and for someone then in his position entrusted with that level of respect and authority to and presumably knowledge to get up on stage and say well we're all just basically looking at, at the same thing we're all just you know different languages but we're all basically saying the same thing same god no big deal the only reason I can think that someone would would say that and do that is that they're trying to, you know, just kind of build morale and popularity with the other people in that stage, in that room, the other religions that are represented to come across as essentially like Mr. Nice Guy. And I don't see anywhere that that has anything to do with the gospel of Christ. I simply don't. What about our one Lord, our one faith, our one baptism, our one God, one father of us all, the, the spirit of unity that we're supposed to have? It's a good thing to long for peace in the world and to long for unity. But the thing that's supposed to bring us unity is the recognition of the oneness we can receive in God through Christ, that there is one gospel, that we are all one in the sense that we're created in the image of God, and yet we have all fallen. We all likewise are, are sinners in need of redemption and that there is one way to bring us back to God. That's the unity that brings about peace. And this kind of 
basically nonsense, as you said, I think that's a kind term, the nonsense that we're looking to to frost over our differences with happy lies, uh, that doesn't, it, it doesn't provide an accurate picture of all the distinct differences in all the religions. So it's basically offensive to anyone that's truly faithful to any of those belief groups, as you pointed out, that is, that's supremely offensive. Um, but also why, why do you, why are you here, sir? Like, what do you even yeah. stand for? It doesn't matter then it really, it just doesn't matter anyway. And yeah. I, I don't, I don't know why you would be on a stage talking about a God if you just said it's useless or it, it doesn't matter. It's the Pope has bought into um, what I've called and Maybe I'm not the only one, to call it, but uh, whateverism, the whateverism of post modernity uh, that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as it works for you. How many times have we heard that? Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I was, <laughs> this is a little bit of a rabbit trail, maybe pertinent. Um, first time I've been, I'm, I've been blessed as have you, I've had somebody stick a camera in my face once or twice and ended up on Fox news or whatnot. And that's fun. Mm -hmm. Get your five minutes of fame, so to speak. And that's fun. Well, the first time I ever had the opportunity to have that happen was on the old show called extreme makeovers home edition. Do you remember oh, that? Really? Yeah. 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 Interesting. Where Ty, Ty uh, with this crazy hair. And then he'd yeah. do, he'd do a, they'd remodel them or build a home in a week. Well, they did that for um, a family outside of Bartlesville, Oklahoma, in the uh, earlier days of my college presidency there. And they asked Op Oklahoma Wesleyan University if our students would like to participate and help with the project. So we did. Well, what's the point of this? While, while we're out there on site, and our students are helping, and it, it was a blast, by the way. Um, one of the uh, movie stars that they used as a designer on the show, and trust me, those designers don't do any of the work. All the work is being done by volunteers and whatnot. They fly in the designer to do their five-minute pitch in front of the camera. So one of the designers, I can't remember her name, but she was this pretty brunette that they flew in as one of the designers, and she was talking about the family that they were building the home for. Mm. Well, the backstory was this family had fallen into hard times because the dad died early of a heart attack and he was a Baptist pastor. Mm. So this Baptist pastor on his 40th birthday got up to go work out at the gym and killed over dead of a heart attack on his 40th mm. birthday. Wow. He had 10 kids. He had a wife and 10 kids and they didn't have any life insurance. They had nothing. Bless their hearts. That's, so this, that's so tough. This story ends up on Extreme Makeover, and they come in and they build them a 5,000 square foot home and all this kind of stuff. Well, it's a Baptist pastor, and this, this family is a Bible-believing family, okay? So mm -hmm. it's impossible for Extreme Makeover producers to hide this fact. They just can't hide it. So they have to acknowledge the Christianity, the conservative evangelical Christianity behind the story. Mm -hmm. Well, this this designer that I'm referring to at one time in the show, she says this, she's designing a room for one of the 10 children. And this particular kid really, really, one of her dreams on her bucket list, this kid wants to jump out of an airplane and parachute. She wants to go parachuting. So this designer decides to make the theme of her room in this new house, an airplane. They actually go get an old fuselage from a Piper Cub or something like that. And they put it in as part of the design. That's so cool. as this designer is designing a room about parachuting, jumping out of a plane, she's trying to say something about the faith of the family. And she acknowledges the Christian faith in a positive way. And then she says, oh, but you know, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as it works for you. Hmm. And she says that on the show. And I thought at the time, you're, you're designing a room that represents parachuting. Yeah, it does matter what you believe, because if you believe that that parachute is going to work, but you didn't pack it right, and you jump out of an airplane, you're going to go plummeting to the ground. You can believe to the cows come home that this is going to save your life, but it won't if you did it wrong. Right. So this 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 nonsense about um, whateverism of moral nihilism, intellectual cognitive uh, nihilism, where it, you can make it up as you go because all ideas are equal. Nobody really believes that. Nobody believes that. The Pope doesn't believe that. He believes capitalism is wrong. He believes socialism is good. We know that about the Pope. He's a socialist. The Pope doesn't believe that um, people should be cruel to homosexuals. He has said, another confusing thing he has said, is that 
priests can now bless same-sex relationships, but yet not same-sex marriage. So what's the difference here, Pope Francis? We're, we're, you're really confusing us. Mm -hmm. my, point, my point in this rant, Rebecca, is this. This the whateverism of the Pope, the whateverism of our culture, the whateverism of extreme makeover home edition is it, it doesn't work because when you yeah. jump out of a plane, plane and say whatever, <laughs> it's at that point in time you want an objective reality, a fact, right. a parable that actually is going to work. Likewise, right. when you jump into eternity, and when you jump into eternity upon breathing your last breath, you want something even better than a parachute. You want the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. And the Pope is doing something akin to handing people empty backpacks with no parachute mm. by saying, oh, it doesn't, matter. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you believe. Well, let's not argue about any of this. Let's not say that your religion is better than mine or mine is better than yours, because where will that get us? Yeah. Well, it, it might get people into heaven, quite frankly, Pope Francis, if, you're, if you would be more clear about what Jesus himself said about the way to enter. The gate is narrow and leads, the gate is broad and easy that leads to destruction. The gate is narrow that leads to eternal life. So maybe, yeah. maybe Pope Francis, you want to tell them about the narrow gate of Jesus Christ. Amen. And it's the only loving thing to do, right? If somebody is headed for destruction, if they're on that broad path, you, you don't just kind of join along again and do the kumbaya thing and just urge them along the broad path because we're all going to go to the same place. Maybe that's not the place you want to go. Can I just submit? Like if everybody's headed in the same direction, what did Jesus say exactly as you pointed yeah. out? That's probably not the road you want to be on, actually. Right. That, I think that's said destruction. Not the one. Right. Destruction. That one. Turn around. Turn yeah. around. Yeah. Oh, oh. it's... It, yeah, I think of C.S. Lewis, and we've talked, you know, you know, he's one of my go-tos. Mm -hmm. um, what did Lewis tell us? That, um, first of all, he said that Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. So you can't just claim like the Sikhs do or the Muslims do that Jesus is just a good prophet. No, good people don't say what Jesus said unless it's true. Right. Don't go around telling people you're God. You don't go around telling people that you can save them from hell. You can save them from their sins. Crazy people do that. <laughs> Rebecca, if you started telling people that, people would rightly want to put you in a straitjacket and sure. in, you know, in you know some some hospital care. Crazy people say crazy things. Mm -hmm. So the only reason what Jesus said is not labeled as crazy through the annals of history is because he proved it through his resurrection. Right. His res resurrection proved that Jesus was telling the truth and that when he said he was the only way that he was telling the truth, when he said that I am equating himself with God, he was telling the truth, that when he said that only he could forgive sins and that if you accept him, then you have entry to heaven. If you deny him, then he will deny you. When he said those things, crazy as they probably sounded to the people that were listening to him, them, those that stuck with him for a few weeks, months, and years actually learned that it was all true mm -hmm. on Easter morning when he rose from the grave. So as C.S. Lewis tells us, either Jesus was a liar, he made it all up for the sake of popularity or power, or he's a lunatic, he's a nut job, because no sane person says what he said unless the third option prevails. And that is, he's the Lord, liar, lunatic, or Lord. And he proved his lordship by virtue of his resurrection. So that makes the whole Christian conversation very different than any other faith because of the resurrection of Christ. Amen and amen again. Never want to interrupt a brother when he's on a roll. Dr. Everett Piper is our excellent guest today, and you can follow his work. It's just everettpiper.com, and I'll put an easy link down below as well. He's got some podcasts. He does a great podcast, as you might be able to know. There's no better time than now to stand for life. And you can stand with Iowa's original pro-life organization, Pulse for Life. They're the longest standing nonprofit pro-life organization in Iowa, and they're dedicated to informing, educating, and inspiring a new generation to value the sanctity of all human life from fertilization until natural death. They serve at the state house. They educate in classrooms at events. They proudly serve on the coalition of pro-life leaders. They are on the front lines of the battle against this throwaway culture of death that we see all around us, and we are winning ground. Hearts and minds 
are changing and the pro-life movement is continuing to grow. And you can be a part of the exciting things that are happening right here in our own backyard at pulseforlife.org and get your finger on the pro-life pulse. Sign up for their newsletter, find ways that you can make a difference and how you can change hearts and minds with their pro-life apologetics course, pulseforlife.org. When a woman faces an unplanned pregnancy, every possible emotion goes through her head. Where can she go for help and for hope? She can go to Inner Visions. Here in our metro, we have two healthcare clinics where she will find hope and help. From free pregnancy testing and STD testing to free ultrasounds, Inner Visions serves women and men with STDs who find themselves in vulnerable situations. They're completely free of charge because of generous donations from folks like you. And their medical clinics help their patients get all the information that they deserve that empowers them to make life-affirming decisions. That's what they do at InterVisions Healthcare Clinics right here in Des Moines. Learn more at intervisionshealthcare.org. That's intervisionshealthcare.org. And you can call 24 hours a day at 515-440-CARE. That's 515-440-2273. You know, we're talking about the definition of Christianity. Uh, so a little bit closer to home, we're having sort of an application debate, a praxis debate, if you will, about what it means to be a Christian as it applies, since it, uh, it is the season. Uh, when chaos ensues at election time, seems to come around every couple of years or so. And this is, as usual, the most important election of our lives. And so everybody wants to know, how should we vote? How should we enact our faith? And we talk a lot about that here on the show. But I think there is a, a central question that you've addressed in some of your writings, um, Dr. Piper, that it, it just has to be asked. And I don't ask it lightly, but I, I think we need to ask ourselves, can you be a Christian and vote for Kamala Harris? And can you be a Christian and extend that to, you know, insert your favorite politician here, the questionable politician here? Can you be, but specifically this came about in the context of the, for me at least, in the context of evangelicals for, for Harris being a thing. And I have taken a lot of flack because I've been very bold about the fact that I, I don't know that 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 is a thing. I don't think, I think definitionally we have some huge problems here, some contradictions um, as as it were, uh, but I, I don't want to put any words in your mouth and I'm here to learn. So if someone asks you, as I'm about to, as someone, Dr. Piper, is it possible for Christians to vote for Kamala Harris? How would you address that question? Well, um, maybe I would answer it with a series of questions. How can you be a follower of Christ and vote for the misogyny of drag queens? How can you be a follower of Christ and vote for the genocide of Planned Parenthood? How can you be a follower of Christ and vote for the immorality of LGBTQIA, the blatant sodomy that that agenda stands for? How can you be a follower of Christ and vote for putting millions upon millions of Americans into dire straits and poverty through hyperinflation. How can you be a follower of Christ and vote for those things? Tell me, tell me that you can be a follower of Christ and vote for Drag Queen Story Hour and the indoctrination of your children in sexual nihilism from the earliest ages in your local schools and even on TV programs like Sesame Street. Mm. You can't get away from it today. We live in a broken world. Now, I know what the response is going to be from any listener that leans on, that is politically on the other side of the fence. They're going to say, what about Trump? I mean, the what about Trumpism? Mm -hmm. What about it? I'm sick and tired of it. Donald Trump is a bore. Okay, I, I, I'm going to make everybody mad on your show. <laughs> Sounds uh, good. Donald, Donald Trump is a bore. He's a brute. Uh, he's he's crass. Mm -hmm. We know all this about Donald Trump. Um, I am not justifying any of Donald Trump's boorish behavior. I am not saying that Christians should just give it a wink and a nod at all. But you're telling me that Donald Trump's boorish behavior there's a moral equivalency to between that and the genocide of Planned Parenthood? Seriously. 
you're going to tell me that there's a that there's moral equivalency between Donald Trump's uh, uh, immoral behavior uh, in his previous marriages and his relationship with women. There's a moral equivalency between that and the degradation of all females by denying that they even exist and pretending that they're nothing but leprechauns and unicorns and that some dude can dress up and drag and pretend to be a woman and steal all of your dignity, identity, and all of your privacy from you. That this is what the Democrat Party represents today, and don't tell me that it doesn't. Kamala Harris has marched in pride parades in San Francisco, and the people that she's marching with are dressed in stuff that I won't even describe on your show because it would embarrass both of us if I did. Mm -hmm. Why in the world would you claim that that is something that you can vote for and stand with your head held high beside your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Now, I'm going to vote for Donald Trump for the third time. Every time I vote for him, I've done it with a, a sigh of uh, resignation. Because I do not think Donald Trump is the best representative of my Christian faith. I don't even think Donald Trump pretends to represent Christian faith. I've never heard Donald Trump pretending to be a born-again Christian. He does not even claim that for himself. So I'm not going to claim it for him. But... Donald Trump, in his previous presidency, has set a track record of defending religious freedom. I had more religious freedom with him rather than less. Uh, the economy was better rather than worse. Therefore, people that are struggling to make ends meet had more money rather than less because inflation wasn't running rampant. Um, Donald Trump believes in giving Christians the freedom to make their choices as to how to educate their kids. And he doesn't think that schools should be indoctrinating our children into the LGBTQ rainbow religion of the day. So that's good enough for me. I'll stop right there. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump gave us three pro-life judges on the Supreme Court. Is Donald Trump pure pro-life? I never thought he was. I never thought he was. No. But he gave us more opportunities to sh save children rather than less. And I'll take that. I'll take those things. It's not a perfect world. Donald Trump, mm, yeah, okay. He is not the best representative of my values, but he sure is a lot better than the alternative. Oh, but you're voting for the lesser of two evils. Yeah, I am. I'm voting for the lesser of two evils. I'm voting for less evil, period. So that's my position. So I probably made everybody mad by picking on Donald Trump and saying, no, I don't think a faithful Christian can vote the other way. You know what? We're equal opportunity offenders around here. It's all good. Um, I've I've said actually, so a couple of things. I've said that the and and I have been probably more vocal than just about any other person in this country in terms of pro-life critique and pro-life disappointment and and uh, concern about Donald Trump. I I asked him to his face, you know, to reassure me that he was going to pre and there were cameras on on me at the time. Uh, so there's a record, but. <laughs> and, and I got a lot of flack. I mean, I've, I've still got the bulletproof vest to prove it. But the the struggle that I have with him over that particular issue is it pales in comparison to a woman who celebrate who's openly campaigning at Planned Parenthoods and who celebrates the death of 25 innocent children in a parking lot at her coronation. There is not one gospel reason that I can think of to support her. So it's not just, and the evangelicals for Harris are out there proclaiming that she is a righteous choice. So openly mm. expecting and, and trying to gather Christians to promote her, to support her. I don't see one good reason other than they have a personal issue with the character and or personality of Donald Trump and they're concerned about him. Harris has absolutely no Christian virtues to speak of. Again, we're we were proclaiming earlier, I think loud and clear and scripturally, that just because somebody claims the name of Christ has no bearing on whether or not they don't get to redefine them what it means to be a Christian. That means they should be under submission to Christ. And I had a really strong debate with a really good friend who would consider himself to be a Christian conservative and has been, you know, we fought toe to, to side by side on a lot of this, but we went toe to toe on this. And he was criticizing me and others like me for saying, you can't be an evangelical that stands for that votes for Kamala and supports her. And I said, there's no gospel reason to do so. 
There, there is none. And he's like, well, you can't, th- there's no politician that th- th- you're not allowed to put a litmus test on this, that the only litmus test is whether or not mm. that they're believing and following Christ. And I'm like, but well, our fruit matters. The, the consistency by our fruits, you will know us. And if there is, if you are supporting a poli- essentially you have to say that all politicians are equally evil. And so we're just not really allowed to use that as a metric for our righteousness. I like, but we would do that in any other area of our life. If we were to look at judgment based decisions, you could tell whether or not somebody was a faithful follower of Christ by stacking up what they say versus what they actually do. And it's, it's to me, I'm, I'm just checking the fruit. I'm just inspecting the fruit. It's it, it, to me the and I, the evangelicals for Harris and whatnot and you know the uh, David French and the Russell Moore contingent uh, shame on them shame on them if you were to tell me right now Rebecca that you can't vote for Donald Trump because of his immoral behavior that he has boasted of which he has he's he's written about it in his books and he boasts about it frequently um, if you were to say I just can't vote for the man I can respect that. If you vote for a third party candidate or a write in candidate, I can respect that. I don't think mm-hmm. it's a good strategic move. I think the strategy of what you're doing is 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 broken, but I don't think the morality of what you're doing is broken. But if you tell me that not only can you not vote for Donald Trump, but that you then will vote for somebody that believes in sacrificing children, that believes in degrading women, again, drag queen story hours, the debauchery of, 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 of that and the misogyny of, of, uh, of RuPaul and whatnot and everything that comes with that, the immorality, the blatant immorality, the LGBTQ rainbow agenda, and then the genocide, uh, the butchery of our children via Planned Parenthood. If, if you tell me that you're going to support that, which is what Russell Moore and David French are doing by aligning with them and then endorsing her as our presidential candidate, shame on you. Shame on you. So I can support you and I can respect you if you're just not going to vote for Donald Trump and you have to vote for a third party. But if you're going to endorse all of those evils that Kamala Harris represents, that she champions as part of her platform and part of her governance strategy, then shame on you. I I really do. I mean, I can't go there. I, I don't respect you if you go that far. Right. And in, in those cases specifically, there's such an animosity on, on their behalf towards Trump personally that it's almost like anybody that stands on his other side, they'll justify voting for because they have it's it's like a um what would you call it? Almost like a reverse magnetism where they'll just be far away. They'll be on the opposite side of whatever Donald Trump stands for because they're just they're, it's so personal. It's I, just here's, I know you need to go, but um, this I, just today, in fact, um, I may write my column for the Washington Times on this topic. Did you see the Rasmussen poll where they ask a thousand registered voters if they thought it would be better off for our democracy if Donald Trump were assassinated? Oh, <gasps> they didn't. Did you see this? Really? They, they ask a thousand voters. Rasmussen, I'll send it to you after we're done. Okay. They ask a thousand voters what they thought. And if you break it down by Democrats, 28% of Democrats said yes. Oh. So oh, no. David French, Russell Moore, when you're in bed with the party where nearly a third of those people that you're hanging with at the Democrat party say that it's a good idea to assassinate your opponents, okay? You might want to tap the brakes a bit and consider you know, getting on a different horse. Wow. I mean, this is stunning i'm not surprised i'm not surprised because you probably get it maybe not as much as i do because you're nicer than i am but i get i get a lot of hate mail a lot of facebook messages and uh, direct mail other dm messages off of twitter where people will say vulgar things to me i'm sure like they'll say stuff like bartlesville oklahoma will be a lot better off when you're dead yeah. I get that kind of stuff. I've actually called the police before just to ask, you know, do I need to be concerned with some of this stuff? Mm-hmm. The the death wish of the left today, the death wish that they have for their opponents just isn't Donald Trump. It's not just Donald Trump. It's you yeah. and it's me. It's anybody who doesn't vote lockstep for their progressive agenda. Mm-hmm. If you dare to speak for the dignity of the child or the dignity of the woman, if you dare to speak against anything rainbow then the world will be better off when you're dead. And they mean it. Yeah. At least 28% of them do. 
because they said to Rasmussen, they actually checked the box. Yeah, we think it'd be better off if he were assassinated. They used the word assassination. That's horrendous. Yeah. But it's not a surprise either because they've been taken captive by the enemy to do his will. If Absolutely. I can just be totally blunt about it, when you when you see life and death and you and you say again, it's that idea that if you it, the the old pro life foundational understanding that when you devalue one human being, you're devaluing everybody. Then unless everybody is seen as being equally valuable and precious, being made in the image of God, if you can denigrate that for some people, for the people you disagree with, for the poor people, for the people from this background or this skin color or this whatever that might be, then it all goes downhill from there. It's all just a slippery slouch towards Gamora aura from that point because who gets to make those decisions uh, yeah, and and if you label donald trump as being unworthy of life that he's the hitlerian figure that is so awful that the world will be better off if he were gone then it's no surprise that crazy people will try to make that happen and and you Absolutely. i we're we're at, at, as our society we're so lost we are so str we're in such darkness we're we're striving for identity we've confused ourselves because we've chased after we looked for love in all the wrong places we're looking for everything to fulfill the god-shaped hole in us and we're rejecting the one place where we can find that love and fulfillment the one person that can truly fulfill us and i see it as a spiritual void a spiritual vacuum that darkness has rushed in and that we as christians ultimately and maybe we can do this here uh, and, and wrap it up this way, that we as Christians, it, we have to shine the light. This is what we're here for. There is no excuse for us to withhold the answer, the, the, the one cure to a dying world that he so loves. We cannot be silent. We cannot stand by when the whole world is dying. We all perish. We're out there. They don't know it. They don't know it. And the, the biggest mark towards compassion is not to say, well, can't we all just go along to get along? Can't we all just minimize our differences and we'll all just kind of paper over anything that may have been a little nasty or uncomfortable in the past? You know, we'll, we'll just put that in back behind us and we'll just all sing together and walk down this broad road towards destruction. The true love and compassion of the Christian says, if it costs me everything. I will share the love of Jesus Christ. It cost him everything for you because he believed you were worth it. He loved you so much that even while you were rebelling, even while we were set against God as enemies toward him, he sent his son to die in our place and to take that punishment on his innocent head for, for himself. I, I can't, even, it's emotional. To think about that, that's the love that we should share for our neighbors down the street and even for our ideological enemies across the aisle, the, what, whatever, whoever that might be. That's the answer. And it reminds me of a, it was just a little two frame cartoon that I will always remember. And it had two opposing sides and one side was basically, it was like a, an ISIS terrorist pointing a gun at a victim. And he said, you're going to believe what I believe, even if it costs you your life. And then on the other side, it was a Christian with a Bible. And he said, I'm going to tell you about Jesus, even if it costs me my life. Mm -hmm. And that is the difference. That's who Christians are called to be. That's we're, we're following where Christ has led. And I, I care. I have to care enough about my neighbor in order to, to speak the truth. And that's the one thing that can set them free. So we can't be silent anymore. We can't pretend like there aren't differences. There absolutely are. But we also have the the way, the truth, and the life that the world is, is perishing now for a lack of understanding, a lack of vision, a lack of knowledge. All we got to do is deliver the mail. We just have to deliver the message. And, and it's our obligation, which, again, obviously you've done a excellent job of wrapping a bow around our conversation, taking us back to Pope Francis's syncretism and his universalism. Uh, how dare he suggest that all these ideas are equal? Because they're not. The idea of Jesus Christ, the logos, the word made flesh and dwelling among us, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the lion of Judah, the lamb of God. How dare the vicar of Christ, how dare Pope Francis water down that exclusive truth? Because what happens when you do, whether it be him or you or me, when you water it down, it is not loving. It's not the loving thing to do. You know, Russell Moore and David French and the like want to keep lecturing conservatives about our obligation to love our neighbor. Well, 
How is it loving your neighbor to allow, if your neighbor is the Springfield, Ohio folks that are having their property stolen and their dignity disrespected by dropping 20,000 illegals in their community and stealing everything that they've worked generations for, how is it loving to the people of Springfield, Ohio to sit back and self-righteously and smugly say, we'll just deal with it, live with right. it. You've got 20 people living in your front yard, defecating on your sidewalk, yelling at you and screaming at you because you won't let them in your house. And you're a 95 pound grandma scared to death. How is it loving to not help her yeah. solve that problem? I mean, the smugness of the elite evangelicals that are saying vote for Harris is aggravating. It's angry. I get angry over it. How is it loving the child to say you should be sacrificed for the convenience of people that don't want you to even live? How is that mm -hmm. loving? How is it loving to those working class folks that are living paycheck to paycheck to go into hyperinflation because of your stupid economic policies as Democrats mm -hmm. that cause a 20% inflation rate? They can't pay their bills. Don't talk to me about loving those people when you smugly ram your politics down their throat. How is it loving to impose the Green New Deal on all of the world when people won't even have food? They won't have food because you're shutting down the farmers, making it impossible for them to grow grain and grow beef. This mm -hmm. is not loving. But yet the David French's and the Russell Moore's of the world are telling us to love our neighbor by voting for Harris. Garbage. It's not loving your neighbor's child to allow the school systems to indoctrinate those children into being confused about their sexuality when they're five, six, eight years of age, of age and thinking that they can cut off functioning organs, healthy organs, because they want to be something different. I mean, my land, if they want to be a pirate, are you going to put out their eye or cut off their leg and give them a peg leg? I mean, this is asinine. It's crazy right. what you're doing. And to have David French, Russell Moore, and the Evangelicals for Harris lecture me and preach to me about loving my neighbor, I don't have any patience for it. And I'm not being very gracious right now. <laughs> I deliver. I'm sorry. I'm mad. <laughs> you're being bold. Well, and that's, I think, the type of, as as we wrap up our discussion, I think that's the, the struggle that I have is just making sure that my response is coming from a charitable place when usually I don't feel very much like it. Because to me, it seems so obvious that that is... It, I mean, it. It's not even cutting off our nose to spite our face. It's it's actively denying the truth that we claim to believe to say that Christians should support someone who stands against everything they stand for. I mean, there's there's nothing that I can see that can be gained from that. It's it's so contradictory as to not even be palatable. And I don't understand how the people who are supposedly the smartest in the room can't see that. So that makes me a, a little bit brusque in my critique. That makes me a little bit more blunt, I have to say. Um, but so, so here I stand. I can, I can do no other. <laughs> and Dr. Everett Piper, always a, just a, a pleasure to have you with us. I always feel like I, I learned, I know for sure that I learned something every time you share our airwaves and it's a, an honor to be able to think well with you and to consider these um, issues of eternal significance because it's more than just the next election. We're talking about people's eternity here and freedom um, maybe I'll just share one because I, I think you'll appreciate this quote from Benjamin Rush, and maybe you, you're familiar with it. We were talking about Constitution Week earlier and why it's necessary for American Christians in particular to value freedom and to value the Constitution and earthly governance, because it is something for here and now. It's not going to exist in eternity, um, as far as I know, but uh, it, it does matter. The way that we govern and the way that our society was created is worth fighting for, and I make the case based in the founders writings like Benjamin Rush, who was open about his Christian faith. And he said that a Republican, so now small r, Republican form of government, he called them a re perfect repositories of the gospel. A direct quote. And then my paraphrase is his idea that we can share, if we can be free to speak, mm -hmm. if we recognize the dignity of the individual and the fact that we each owe uh, uh, allegiance, responsibility, obedience to God, but to allow that person to work it out in their their own salvation and fear and trembling, so to speak, without interference from the state, and that they're allowed to pursue their own prosperity, and they're allowed to pursue doing right to their neighbors and developing a society in, under those auspices, that that is the perfect ground for which we can, uh, you know, be ever thankful to them, that we can 
evangelize our neighbor, that we can spread the gospel far and wide. And he said, that's why we have to have a Republican, meaning a self, self-governance self that is representative um, and that that's the best way that Christians can actually spread the gospel. So that was, I think, the perfect um, summation of why I think our country is worth fighting for, for the Christian, why we can't just give up or say, uh, you know, we opt out of our political system. I think we ought to recognize the unique uh, gift that God has given us in our country and that it's, it's well worth fighting for. And I, for one, I'm going to, to have, make my voice heard and to stand up and use my vote and use my voice to, to treasure the good things that God has given us. Well, and I'll just say this very briefly Uh, in the political season, uh, I, I'm a pragmatist when it comes to politics. I'm very conservative. I mean, uh, anybody who's listened to me for the last 15 minutes, let alone the last 15 years, knows I'm conservative and I don't apologize for it. I believe in conserving things. I'm a conservationist. I believe in clean water and clean air, and I believe that I'm responsible for stewarding and conserving those things. But even more important, I'm responsible for conserving the time-tested truths of God as a Christian. And in the United States, I think uh, we are, we're given a system where we can live to fight another day. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being an incrementalist. That you're, It's a chess match. You're positioning yourself to live to fight another day. For what? For greater freedom. Greater freedom. Because with freedom comes the, the uh, privilege of sharing the gospel in a culture where the government isn't telling you you can't. Mm-hmm. So we live to fight another day. Is Donald Trump perfect? Absolutely not. Does he embarrass me at times? Absolutely. (laughs) Would I have preferred Ron DeSantis? Absolutely. I said so, and I still say so, Mm -hmm. to the point where I make my Trumper friends mad. But (laughs) I lost. I lost. Here we are. And the bottom line is I have a decision to make. And my decision is going to be a chess move to live to fight another day, an incremental move for more freedom rather than less. And when you come right down to it, David French, Russell Moore, or anybody that wants to argue with me, you know darn well that a vote for Trump is a vote for more freedom. You're going to get more freedom. You're going to get more religious freedom, more freedom of speech, more economic freedom, more educational freedom. With Donald Trump, then you're going to get the other direction. Why would you vote for less freedom rather than more? It's a strategic move, an incremental move, not a perfect one, but Bible-believing Christians should position themselves to live to fight another day for the freedom of their neighbors. Well said, as always. <laughs> Dr. Fiber, thank you. Blessings. Our mission is to love God, to serve people, and to live free.